Dear friends, uh, Manfred Weber, uh, Ursula, it's really great to be back and to meet you again. Uh, this is actually the second time I meet the European People's Party, and uh, I know that you are uh, uh, in the middle of a, a European election campaign, and it's not for me to give you any advice about uh, campaigning, uh, but what I can say is that I really recognize the importance of the European uh, People's Party, EPP, and the European institutions, uh, because uh, you are the biggest party in the European Parliament. Uh, you represent the parties which have always been very strong supporters of uh, NATO, and I thank you for that uh, strong uh, support. But also because I fully realized, also based on what uh, Ursula just said, uh, the importance of uh, the close cooperation between uh, the European Union and NATO. And one of my top priorities as Secretary General of NATO has been actually to strengthen cooperation between uh, NATO and the European Union. And together with Ursula and with on many other uh, political leaders uh, in Europe, I, we have been able to lift the cooperation between uh, NATO and the European Union up to uh, new and unprecedented levels. This is important because um, uh, despite the fact that we are two different institutions, we have a lot in common. We have history in common. Uh, we have to understand that both the European Union and NATO, we were created after the end of the Second World War as multilateral institutions to make sure that we never again experienced anything like what we experienced during the Second World War. So we are, we are institutions we are, which are there to preserve the peace, to build cooperation and, uh, and to uh, 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 help to promote freedom and democracy. We have been successful and we have supported each other, the European Union and uh, NATO. So we have a common history. Uh, uh, then we have also common values, democracy, rule of law, individual liberty. And of course we share also uh, very much the same members. Uh, many, many, many of the same member states. Uh, but I uh, actually also like to remind uh, us on the following fact that more than 90% of the people living in the European Union, they live in a NATO country. So there's no way you can strengthen the defense of uh, EU or Europe without at the same time strengthening the defense of uh, NATO. That's very much the same thing. And, uh, and uh, we also have to realize that uh, uh, by working together, we are also addressing uh, common challenges. Uh, we work together in cyber, in, uh, in hybrid, in maritime operations. Uh, NATO is present in the GNC, helping to implement the uh, agreement between Turkey and the European Union on, uh, on uh, migrant and, uh, and uh, on the migrant uh, crisis. So I see a lot of uh, areas of, uh, of cooperation between uh, uh, NATO and the European Union, and I welcome the fact that we have been able to lift that to a new and unprecedented uh, level. But at the same time, I also see the purpose and the need uh, to uh, strengthen uh, European efforts on defense, as Ursula just mentioned. Uh, I have welcomed that uh, because I really believe that uh, more uh, EU efforts on defense can help to strengthen, um, uh, it can, it can help to develop new capabilities, increase defense spending, uh, and also help to address uh, uh, what we call the fragmentation of the European defense uh, industry. And I have mentioned these examples, and, uh, and Ursula and also Manfred actually mentioned the importance of improving efficiency when it comes to uh, European efforts on defense. Um, you know that in Europe there are 17 different types of main battle tanks. In the United States there, there is only one. Uh, in Europe there are 13 different types of air-to-air -air missile. In the United States and they have three. And in European nations have 29 different types of naval frigates. The United States has four. I mention this because it highlights the importance of uh, more cooperation in Europe when it comes to uh, uh, European defense. Therefore, European Defense Fund is good. The uh, PESCO is good because these are ways to try to address this fragmentation, to increase efficiency and to make sure that European uh, allies, uh, uh, the European Union is delivering more when it comes to defense. This is something I strongly welcome uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, which I, on behalf of NATO, has many times uh, expressed that we support. At the same time, it is extremely important 
uh, to also understand uh, uh, what uh, Ursula also mentioned and uh, also Manfred mentioned, and that is that the EU efforts on defense should not compete, not duplicate, uh, not substitute uh, NATO. Uh, partly because we historically have been working together. The success, the success story uh, about the enlargement of the European Union is very much linked to the presence of NATO. NATO provided the security guarantees, uh, the security framework for the enlargement of both NATO and the European Union. So uh, we have worked together uh, to make sure that uh, this historic enlargement, which Poland, many of the countries here are part of, was possible. And we have to make sure that we continue to work together and to make sure that we need to maintain the transatlantic bond and make sure that European unity doesn't substitute transatlantic unity. We need both European unity and transatlantic unity, not either or. And I say this also because perception matters, rhetoric matters, and therefore we should never create the impression that one is going to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to substitute the other. This is also about, so this is about history, it's about political messaging, but it's also about money. After Brexit, 80% of NATO's defense expenditure will come from non-EU allies. Three of the four battle groups we have in the eastern part of the alliance will be led by non-EU allies. Uh, uh, the United States, Canada, and, um, and, uh, and the United Kingdom. Uh, then uh, the one in, 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 in Lithuania is led by uh, Germany. And it's also a part about geography, uh, uh, because uh, uh, Turkey is not an EU member, but Turkey is important for the defense of Europe in the south, fighting Daesh, ISIL. Norway and Iceland, not, not uh, very big countries, uh, but uh, they are important uh, because it's up in the north. Uh, and then in the west you will have Canada, United States, and the uh, and United Kingdom. So, I appreciate very much EU efforts on defense, but I also appreciate very much every time you highlight that this is not to s compete with or replace or duplicate NATO, uh, the more you can highlight that this, this is part of strengthening the European efforts within the NATO framework, uh, the better, because then we avoid any misunderstanding. Um, then I am aware of that questions are asked, and that's also part of the European debate, about whether we can trust the transatlantic partnership, whether, whether, whether we have to develop something uh, independently or outside NATO because the transatlantic uh, partnership is not reliable. The paradox is that while there are asked questions or there are questions asked both in Europe and in North America about the strength of NATO, the strength of the transatlantic uh, partnership, at the same time we are actually doing more together than we've done for, uh, for many years, North America and Europe. I am not denying, or actually I think uh, we just have to uh, all realize that there are disagreements between uh, NATO allies. Uh, between Europe and uh, North America, but also within Europe, uh, and also we see between, for instance, uh, uh, the two North American member states. On trade, on climate change, on the Iran nuclear deal, on burden sharing, and on other important issues. The paradox is that despite those disagreements, within the NATO framework, when it comes to security and defense, we are actually able to do more together, North America and Europe, than we have done for many years. We have, for the first time in our history, we have now combat-ready battle groups in the eastern part of the alliance, with the four battle groups in the three Baltic countries and one in Poland. Uh, we have um, uh, forward presence, NATO forward presence in the Black Sea region uh, in Romania, and we have, uh, we are now um, significantly increasing the size of our uh, uh, response force, increasing the readiness of forces, tripling the size of the NATO response force, and adding even more forces to, uh, to our high readiness uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, we are reforming the command structure, 
and European allies are investing more in defense. So my message to the United States is that yes, I accept that they want fair burden sharing, but actually we see now that European allies and Canada are of the years of cutting defense budgets starting to increase. All European allies have stopped the cuts. All European allies have started to increase. More European allies now meet the 2% uh, target. Back in 2014, when we made the decision, it was only three. Now uh, it's seven, and we will soon be even more. And also those who are not yet reached 2% are significantly increasing defense spending. So European allies are doing more within the NATO framework. Uh, but also the United States is doing more. Because the impression is sometimes that, that the US is, is reducing their commitment to Europe. Uh, the reality is that after the end of the Cold War, the United States reduced their presence in Europe. But over the last years, the United States is now again increasing. Uh, with uh, more military presence, uh, with uh, more exercises, um, the last U.S. battle tank left Europe in December 2013. Now the United States is back in Poland with a rotational armored brigade, many battle tanks, uh, and it shows an increased uh, U.S. commitment to, uh, uh, to European defense. So I'm not trying to deny that there are differences. Uh, I'm not trying to uh, uh, say that uh, trade, uh, climate change, uh, and all the other issues where we see differences are uh, not important. Uh, they actually are. But I'm saying that, this, that despite these differences, we have proven that within security and defense, uh, we are actually stepping up, strengthening the transatlantic bond. And we need that transatlantic bond uh, because in a time with more uncertainty, more unpredictability, we need stronger international institutions, the EU and NATO, not either EU or uh, NATO. The last thing I would just briefly mention, uh, because I, uh, I understand that we should have some time for Q&As afterwards, is that we have many challenges we have to address as a transatlantic uh, uh, alliance, Europe and North America together. Fighting terrorism, we have made a lot of progress. Cyber, uh, the challenge is related to also a rising uh, China. Uh, I see a great potential for partnership, but also see some challenges. But there is one urgent issue we need to address together, and that is the question related to intermediate range uh, uh, weapons. Uh, Ursula, she's 60 years old. I am 60 years old in a few days. Uh, two young you know, people, <laughs> Ursula and I. Uh, um, um, but, um, but, we, but we are old enough to remember the discussion in Europe about intermediate range weapons in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, and, uh, and then we deployed the Russians deployed a lot of SS-20 missiles, nuclear capable. NATO responded with Pershing and cruise missiles. And it was a great debate, a, a big discussion, that shaped the understanding of security uh, in the minds of many, many Europeans, including me. Then we reached this milestone agreement, the INF uh, agreement, back in 1987. And that was an agreement that didn't reduce the number of missiles. It actually, it actually banned all of them, zero. And that is a, is, is, is a, is a, is a, has been an agreement which has served us all well for many decades. Now Russia is violating the agreement. Russia um, is deploying new missiles, SSC-8. They are hard to detect. They are mobile. They are nuclear capable. They can reach European cities. Uh, they have little, if any, warning time at all, uh, and thereby they also reduce the potential threshold or the threshold for any potential use of nuclear weapons in a conflict. All nuclear weapons are dangerous, but weapons with little warning time, hard to detect, mobile, are, if anything, even more dangerous. And therefore, the Obama administration raised this issue with Russia, the violations of the INF Treaty, it has been followed up with the current U.S. administration, and all NATO allies have agreed that Russia is in violation, and all NATO allies call on Russia to come back into compliance with the uh, agreement. At the same time, uh, we have started uh, to prepare for a world without the agreement and uh, uh, with more Russian missiles in Europe. For me, this is a 
strong example of the importance of transatlantic unity. Because this is U.S. having an agreement with, with, with Russia. But it's directly impacting the security of Europe. So there's no way we can address this issue of new nuclear missiles without the, within the transatlantic uh, uh, alliance. And the great thing is that faced with this very serious challenge, NATO has proven that we are united, both in uh, uh, putting the onus, uh, the responsibility on Russia, violating the treaty, but also agreeing that we need to respond to this in a united way, as an alliance uh, coordinated. Not with bilateral arrangements, but NATO as, as, as a whole, transatlantic. It's far too early to say what will be the outcome of our process, uh, but what we can say is that we will, me will be measured and we uh, 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 will uh, be coordinated and we don't have any intentions of deploying new nuclear missiles uh, in, uh, uh, in Europe, no new uh, ground-launched uh, weapon uh, systems, nuclear. Um, the last thing about this is that, uh, for me, this highlights the importance of NATO's approach to Russia, deterrence, defense, and dialogue. We need to be certain that we provide credible deterrence and defense to avoid any misunderstanding of our resolve and our cap capability to defend all allies. That's the way to preserve the peace, to prevent a conflict. At the same time, Russia is our neighbor. Russia is there to stay. We need to talk to them. Uh, we need dialogue. And we need to continue to strive for arms control. Because we don't want a new arms race. Uh, we don't want a new Cold War. So therefore, uh, this dual track, firm, strong, but also open for dialogue, is the way we need to approach uh, our uh, neighbor Russia, because at some stage we need to try to improve the relationship with Russia. To do all this, we need strong Europe, we need European unity, but we need also transatlantic unity. Uh, two world wars and the Cold War have taught us that we are stronger and safer together not apart. Thank you.